Titus chapter 3, verse 8. These are the words of God. This is a faithful saying. And these things I will have that you, Titus, affirm constantly. That they which have believed in God might be careful to maintain good works. These things are good and profitable to men. And now, beloved, let us test everything that is said and be sure to hold fast to that which is good. Amen. Our title today is, and it'll come up on the screen in a minute, I'm sure, Good Works That Come From a Genuine Faith. Good Works That Come From a Genuine Faith. Our outline is threefold. I'm a little clicky here again. There we go. The good saying that is to be affirmed constantly. These are all in verse 8. We're going to have a look at that faithful saying of Paul. Secondly, that good works that are to be maintained carefully. And thirdly, the good profit we are to steward faithfully. So there's three aspects to verse 8 this morning. There is uh, some good work to be done in it to encourage us as believers here today for the good works that we are called to do. The main point being that those who profess to know the good news of the gospel must go on to prove the genuineness of their faith by being fruitful in doing good works for God's glory. So an acknowledgement of the good news is not good enough. Profession alone is no proof of salvation. It's what the uh, Puritans would call professors, not academic professors, but people with an empty profession. The scripture clearly teaches that if you confess Christ, you will go on to know him and obey him and your good works will be proof that you are living in the light of good doctrine and you have received the good news. Amen. So this is not works by salvation, as I will clarify today. This is works as a proof that you are saved. There's a big difference between the two, which we'll touch on today. Now, as we saw over the last two weeks, the Trinitarian God, Father, Son, and Spirit, unique to Christianity, Other religions, demons, believe in a God. We believe in a Trinitarian God, the Father, the Son, and the Spirit. All worked sovereignly in our salvation. They interposed into uh, the world from eternal decree of the Father to the sending of the Son to the sending of the Spirit into our hearts whereby we are regenerated and renewed and we cry in prayer, Abba, Father. We become children of the living God. Paul reminds the Cretans, and maybe as we're in Titus 3, let's have a look at it in our Bibles. Firstly, in that saving process, and this is again a quick recap, where we were. Originally, we weren't saved, and God has graciously saved us. We ourselves, in verse 3, were foolish and disobedient, deceived, serving different kinds of lusts and pleasures, living in malice and envy, hateful and hating one another. But... Martin Lloyd-Jones, Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones, famous preacher in the UK during World War II, said, thank God for the buts in the Bible. But after that, the kindness and the love of God our Saviour appeared. That is, God the Father was loving in that he decreed before the foundation of the world those who would be saved. He then accomplished this in the fullness of time by sending his Son. His kindness and love appeared in a person, Jesus Christ, born of a virgin. Yes, mums, without a mother, Jesus wasn't a real human being and couldn't really die in our place. So motherhood and the gospel picture beautifully as they do husband and wife in the home of the gospel. It's a wonderful way of seeing that God is male and female in the respect that he made man in his image. Women, you are no lesser made in the image of God. Amen. We've got to get our doctrine right here. If we don't get it right in the book of Genesis, we end up way off. 
so we get it right. So this is this beautiful picture here where Jesus is born into the human race. He's yet still truly man, so he can die in our place, but he's still truly God because only God can absolve sins. That's why it has to be the God-man who dies on the cross. And of course, in the resurrection, it's proof that it was God dying on the cross because only God can raise himself from the dead. No man, no self-made guru, no proclaimed uh, spiritual leader uh, may have done some great things, may have done some supposed good things in the world for humanity, tried to make the world a better place, but they didn't prove it by three days later raising themselves from the dead. That's why Jesus can say, I am the way, the truth, and the life. I prove it because life is found in me. And by the way, for us, that means eternal life. We go on and see in the text that there's this beautiful picture in verse 5 that the Spirit of God is given to us and we are saved, we are regenerated. That is a new genesis, a new birth that is being born again. And we are renewed, we are kept by God's power, by the help of the Holy Spirit. And we are then justified by grace in His Son. We are justified by His grace. That is the Father's penalty for sin was ratified upon the cross of Calvary and we are now justified. This doctrine of justification by faith alone through the death of Christ, we are now found in him as righteous. This is called double imputation. Our sins on the cross of Calvary, if you believe on Christ, have faith in what he has done, our sins are attributed to Christ on the cross and that's the first imputation. And then the second imputation is Christ's righteousness is attributed to you. So that when you get to heaven, you are not found in your own good works. Your own righteousness, you are found in Christ. So the heavenly account says, you are made right with God in Christ. Now you're still outworking your salvation here on earth, amen? But in heaven, you need to know. It's just like you're living your life, you know, you've got bills to pay, but in heaven or in your bank account, so to speak, the bills are covered. There's enough money in the bank. It's a weak analogy, but I'm just trying to get you in a place where you can see that from a heavenly perspective, we are justified in the Godhead and we are what the Bible says there in verse 7 of Titus 3, made heirs. We are now found in Christ and we, have, we are heirs. We are heirs of God's promises. Every promise is yes and amen in him, not in you, but in him. We are heirs of mansions, heirs of his kingdom, not just his earthly kingdom and influence here as we do his will. His will be done, his kingdom come. Whenever his will is being done, that is where his kingdom is present. Right now, his kingdom is in the hearts of men. My kingdom is within but eventually his kingdom will be without and the millennial kingdom will reign with him and then we will reign with him in the eternal kingdom beyond the millennium into all the future ages where God himself, we will become heirs of God himself and joint heirs with Christ. Remembering that God himself is our inheritance. We're thinking, oh, I'm going to see my mansion and all these other things. God himself is our inheritance. So saints, we're shown by Paul, that we were once unsaved, God graciously interposed in our salvation by decreeing it from eternity past, sending his son in time, Christ died upon a cross, paid for the sins of those who would believe on him. As we believe on Christ, we are given regenerative power of the Spirit to be saved. The Spirit of God awakens our dead heart, we're dead in our sins, awakened and alive to Christ, that we may then serve him with the help of the renewing power of the Spirit. We need to be, keep on being filled with the Spirit. We're told to walk in the Spirit and not in the flesh. And all the while, we have a sure hope that we are justified in heaven. It's not according to how good you went today or this week. Hopefully, you're improving in your walk with holiness because without holiness, no man will see the Lord. And We can't do that without the help of the Holy Spirit. But either way, we know that we are justified according to the heavenly account, and we are heirs in Christ. The wonderful truth. We have our earthly position, 
and we have our heavenly position. And now one final time, Paul draws us down in the text in verse 8 to what our responsibility is on earth. And that is for Titus to affirm to the church that although they're justified in heaven, although they're heirs of all these eternal glories, they must get on with it now in their lives on earth by doing good works. And they must be careful to maintain those good works. Now, I know some of you uh, love that idea of all of those heavenly thoughts and then getting back down with it on earth and there's this tension there. Well, I believe that's true in Scripture. Uh, Some of us have heard the phrase, you're so heavenly minded that you are no earthly good. I don't believe that this saying is actually intrinsically true. For the more heavenly minded a person is, the more earthly a good they will be able to do. Uh, I'll give you an example. Acts 10.38, Jesus is the most heavenly minded man that's ever walked the earth. Amen? And how much earthly good did he do? Well, Acts 10.38, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and with power who went about doing good. So you can't do any earthly good unless you're heavenly minded. Unless you're thinking about how great God is and how a debt and duty we owe him to serve him faithfully and fully and fervently to our final living day on this earth, he went about doing good, healing the oppressed of the devil, for God was with him. In Colossians chapter 3, verse uh, 2, we're told to set our minds on what? Things above, on heavenly things. So this whole notion that, oh, you're always in your Bible and you're always reading and you don't really do too much. Well, I think it should be not either or, but everyone, both. As we read the sacred book, as we read the scriptures, we see what our duty is to God and our fellow man. And we get on with it. We do good works. So this is where we find ourselves today in the text, looking at... I don't know what's happening with my clicker, but we're just going to have to work through it here. Um... It would help if I turned it on. Who's clapping? (laughs) Point one, it is a faithful saying. (laughs) And these things I would affirm constantly. I would affirm you to uh, bring out constantly. So what is the good saying that's to be affirmed? The faithful saying that is to be affirmed? Constantly? That is ongoingly. Well, the Greek word there for faithful saying is pistos logos. It literally means a faith-filled saying. The saying is true. Now, what is the saying? What is the saying that needs to be affirmed? Well, it's verses 4 through 7. The saying is the gospel. The saying is how we're saved. That God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, the triune God, saves us. Without him, saints, there would be no salvation at all constantly affirmed to the church that he is the God who saves. He is the Father, the Son, and the Spirit. We can depend on these truths regarding our salvation. Why is it faithful? Because the God who promised it is faithful. He is the God who cannot lie. Why can't he lie? Because he is truth. His whole character is truth. He cannot lie. He cannot contradict his word. If his word is there in front of us, it can't say anything different. The Holy Spirit can't tell you something different that's in his word. We need to be clear on that. And a preacher's job is to take the truth of Scripture and affirm it and preach it faithfully. Amen? Once we get off the Scripture, once we get off what the apostles and the Scripture has, we've been given, we are in uh, a lot of trouble. Now, Titus, this salvation message of the triune God... God saving men, God sending his son, God sending his spirit into our hearts. You must affirm this constantly. Can you hear what's happening here? Preaching the gospel is therefore not a one-off thing. Well, I preach the gospel sort of once a year and, you know, trust that most of the people in the church will be here and they'll hear the good news. No, you are to preach the gospel constantly to yourself It's to be heard in every sermon of the pulpit, weaved and embedded in. Uh, What is the point 
of a message without the gospel being in it. Amen? It is by the means of the gospel that we are saved. He's to do this in the Greek constantly, but affirming. The Greek word affirming is to confidently and emphatic assert and to not doubt. So Titus, you're not to doubt the truth of this gospel imperative. It's also seen, and you're welcome to turn there back in 1 Timothy with me. This is the only other time the Greek word appears in 1 Timothy chapter 1 verse 7. Paul says of the false teachers that they desire to be teachers of the law. So they desire to take God's word, the Old Testament, and they don't understand neither what they're saying nor what they are affirming. So this same word here is telling us that these false teachers are using the law or the Bible wrongly. In essence, Paul is saying to Titus, with the same commitment that false teachers have to convincing people of their lies, you need to double down your efforts, Titus, to affirm constantly in the same way to persuade believers of the truth in the gospel and the saving faith that's in Christ. To get the gospel wrong is to get our eternal salvation wrong. You don't want to get that wrong. Christ being the chief cornerstone, and by rejecting the gospel, you reject Christ, and Christ becomes a stumbling stone to you because you're trying to do it through works or another way. You're trying to add to Scripture or whatever that might look like. Now, there's a negative inference here too in the text. If you have a look at it back in Titus chapter 3, if he doesn't preach these truths constantly, he's going to be what? Not faithful, but unfaithful. So to not preach a faithful saying, to not preach the full gospel, to not preach that the triune God sovereignly interposes into our lives and saves us, that you can't save yourself, that in actual fact that there's nothing you can do in your Christian walk apart from give glory to God uh, is the primary focus of the text here. Now, to clarify Paul's faithful sayings, we can go back to 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 15. There's four of them that he gives in the, the pastoral epistles. The first one is, is in 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 15. All to do with our saving walk with Christ. This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation that Christ Jesus came to the world to save sinners of whom I am chief. So the first faithful saying focuses on the fact that Christ came into the world to save us. It infers that we can't save ourselves. We needed Christ to do that for us. The second faithful saying is in 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 8. The godliness is profitable to all things, having promise of the life that now is and of that which is to come. This, verse 9, is a faithful saying and worthy of of all acceptation. If you're saved, you'll be living godly and you'll be living, notice in the text there, we'll look at it today, profitably. So there's a theme in the Gospels of profitable stewardship or profitable servanthood, that godliness promotes that profit. Not bodily exercise, not physical activities, but heavenly activities or good works in the name of Christ that promote profit and the promise of eternal life. Now turn with me to 2 Timothy, chapter 2, verse 11. This is to do with our persevering in our salvation. It was a faithful saying, for if we be dead or died with him, we shall also live with him. If we suffer, we shall also reign with him. And if we deny him, he will also deny us. The true person whom Christ has truly saved will persevere until the end through suffering and they will ultimately be kept and maintained in the faith to glorification or the way Paul puts it is reigning with him. So it's a proof that we will persevere, perseverance of the saints, and we will endure to the end and reign with Christ. And the final one we see here today in Titus Chapter 3, which is the faithful saying that Tim, Titus is to affirm constantly that those who believe 
might be careful to maintain good works. Let's look at point two together. We're to maintain good works. See in this section, part B of verse 8, they which have believed in God, so he's addressing believers, they've believed in God, but believing is not enough. Rather, those that have believed, those who confess to know Christ and live for him, must not be satisfied, as we've spoken earlier, of an empty profession, but must have fruits and deeds worthy of that profession. What are the enduring fruits of your life? What have you got to show for your Christianity? Note the embedded warning to be careful. That's a warning if I've ever read it in the text. Careful of what? Well, careful to continue on in good works because if you don't, the careful is, opposite of careful, neglectful. If you're not careful of something, you'll neglect it. You give care to it or you neglect it. We're talking about uh, mothers here today with Mother's Day. You can care for your children or some mothers neglect their children because it's just all become too much. And so this is the idea of be careful, Christian, if you say you believe in God, that your life should verify that by the good works you do for God's glory. Be sure here that you can't just say you're justified and then ignore your sanctification. Give careful, reflective thought to actioning my obedience and making good on a good work. Making good on a good work is really the emphasis of the Greek. And why must we be careful about these good works to continue and maintain them? Because that's what we're called to do. Have a look up on the screen, Ephesians 2.10. We are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus to good works. Why were you saved? Why were you regenerated? Why were you created again or made new in Christ? For good works, which God has before ordained that we should walk in them and obey them. So let me get this right. God already knows, because he's God, the works you should walk in. Now it's up to you to do them. He's going to give you opportunity to do them. He puts you in a church to serve in a church. He puts you in situations to read God's word, study it, know what to do, so that you have knowledge and you have wisdom. It won't come by accident. In Matthew chapter, get to our next verse here, just a few verses to convince you here that I'm not preaching a works salvation. Jesus assumes good works of every believer when he says, let your light so shine before men that they may see your what? Your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. The light is indicative of somebody who's saved and they are to see your good works, period. The world should see it. Just forget about the church for a minute seeing it. The world should see it. 1 Peter 2.12, conduct yourselves with such honour among the Gentiles that though they slander you as evildoers, they may see your good works and glorify God on the day he visits us. Not only should we be careful in the text to maintain good works, but the word maintain implies what? What do you do when you maintain something? You gardeners, you're maintaining your garden. You're, you people who drive a car, which is I'm assuming most of us here, unless you're not old enough, you maintain your car, don't you? You listen to it when it makes a noise. You don't just turn the stereo up louder. Some of you might do it. Wind your window up so you don't hear it. And you get your car serviced. You give it some attention when it needs it. So it keeps going and it keeps performing. Now, this is one idea of maintenance. I get that. It's a sort of a practical idea or a pragmatic way of maintaining. It is one close to the idea as believers that we're talking about here. But simply put, how can we be expected to do good works for God when we have nothing of God's good word inside us? We've got nothing to draw from. Out of your innermost being will flow what? Rivers of living water. The word of God needs to be in you for good works to come out of you. And remember, it's not good enough to say. It must be seen in deed. Let's have a look at some verses here. Critical one that I want to have a look at today. It's why we are... Uh, 
not just justification by faith people alone. It's a very important doctrine. Let me say that again. We are not justification by faith people alone. We are show us your faith by your works people as well. Both are in sacred scripture. Both are in scripture aided. You can't say, I'll take Paul's words where I, it's by grace. I'm justified. I can do what I want. I can live how I want. Uh, I may sin the more that grace may more abound. Hyper grace teaching. It's erroneous. It's a lie. Paul already calls it in Romans. No, he says, you must go on to outwork your salvation in fear and trembling. Why? Because you've got a responsibility now. You've got a responsibility before God to do good works as a proof that the good God is resonant within you by his good Holy Spirit. Pivotal verse. Second Timothy, if it's not underlined and circled, thank you, J.R., you took us through it this morning as you uh, hosted us, uh, set us up for the preaching of the word of God today by helping us look again to the Lord in song and word, all scripture, all scripture from Genesis to Revelation is given by inspiration of God. And here's the word again, is profitable. So there's no profit if you're outside of scripture. You can decide what you want to do. I'm going to do this for God. That's a really good idea I've got. If it's not based in a scriptural premise, principle or promise, it won't get profit by God. It won't. Because only scripture and obedience to scripture is profitable and is de deigned a good work. So profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, that is mature, thoroughly furnished to what? To all good works. So a good work cannot come out of anything but a scriptural foundation. We've got to be clear on that. Of course, William Plumer, uh, favourite classic author of mine, a holy life, fruitful and good works, is essential to the making of our calling and election, sure. But alas, men will wrangle for religion, write for it, fight for it, die for it, anything but live for it. Oh. What's this whole idea, Wayne? I, I, I'm a man of the word, I'm good, I know my Bible, that should be good enough. Well, let's have a look at Colossians 3.17. Whatever you do in word or deed, both are implied that you'll do both. Do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God and the Father by him. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 17, comfort your hearts and establish yourselves. Assurance in the faith by what? Every good word and work. The word, if it's God's word, is living and active and powerful. It's at work in our lives, in our actions, in our obedience. At 1 John 3, 18, my little children, let us not love in word, neither in tongue, but in deed and in truth. Not convinced of what a good work is, let's have a look at it in London Baptist Confession. Let's go back to some of the classic confessional statements of our church here. Good works are only such as God has commanded in his holy word. If it's outside of scripture, it's not a good work. You might do a, a good deed for somebody, help a little old lady across the road, go buy groceries for somebody and put it on their front step because you know they're struggling. They're good, but they're not good works in the sense that they're going to be rewarded by God in heaven. Well, what about a cup of cold water in the name of the Lord? Well, that's true in that sense where you're doing something good, but ultimately obedience to God's word Loving your brethren, if that's an act of love, God knows the motive of that heart action that you take. God also knows an action that we're doing to bring glory to ourselves, doesn't he? So he's the judge of that. He's the judge of the internal heart intention of something. So good works are only as such as God has commanded in his holy word and not such as without the warrant thereof are devised by men out of blind zeal or upon any pretense of good intentions. So you may have good intentions, you might be zealous for the Lord, but unless it's grounded in God's word, it cannot be deemed a good work. Amen? Section 2 goes on and tells us how they are seen as good works. These good works are done in obedience to God's commandments, are the fruits and evidences of a true and lively faith, and by them, believers manifest or make clear 
their thankfulness, strengthen their assurance, edify their brethren, adorn the profession of the gospel, stop the mouths of the adversaries, and glorify God, whose workmanship they are. Now, just that little line there, whose workmanship they are, this is the confession's way of saying that any good work you do to achieve those things, God has worked in you. You didn't do yourself. Without God's help, without the help of the Holy Spirit, you couldn't do that. You couldn't do any of those things. And these works were, as we read before in Ephesians 2, created in Christ Jesus. So when God chose you in Christ, he knew all the works you would do as well that would bring him glory as a proof that you would not just acknowledge the good gospel, but you would do all the good works in his name to bring him glory as a proof that you are a son or a daughter of glory. That having their fruit to holiness, they may have the end of eternal life. Let me be clear. There's nothing we can do, no good work we can do in our own strength. Amen? It is impossible to please God without faith. And a good work must be done in faith, which is a fruit of the Spirit, not of the flesh. For no flesh can be justified in the sight of God. Good works are therefore a fruit of the Spirit, and none but the saved have the Spirit and can do them in faith. Good works are the result of salvation, not the cause of it. And the divine order is salvation and then service so faith in god must always precede any good works for his glory let me say that again faith in god must always precede any good works for his glory this is why james says i will endeavor to show you my what faith by my works why does the hebrew writer say faith is unseen and then he runs through all the acts of the lives of the great men and women of god in all of church history up till that point he wants to show you what faith looks like in somebody's life. It's evidenced by your life, your track record. Moses and Gideon and Abraham, believing God, trusting him, having to trust the sovereign, supernatural, all-powerful God despite what came to them. Wonderful picture here of what it is to live by faith and to outwork your salvation as a proof of that faith. Well, let's stand on the shoulders of some giants here. C.H. Spurgeon. Faith is presupposed as the absolutely indispensable foundation of good works. Faith. You cannot work that which will please God if you are without faith in him. And as there is no coming to God in prayer without believing that he is and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him, so there is no bringing of any other sacrifice to him without faith, suitable to the business in hand. For living works, you must have living faith. And for loving works, you must have loving faith. When we know and trust God, then with holy intelligence and sacred confidence, we work his pleasure. End quote. Incredible. So what are good works, saints? So there's no mystery to this, I'm doing a good work or I'm not. It is obeying God's word, living as he commands. If you love me, Jesus says, you will obey my commands, not add new ones, not twist the ones you've got. That's why Jesus spoke so vehemently against the Pharisees. He called them snakes. Why? Well, their father was the devil. You will love my word, you will obey my word. Why do you call me Lord and not do the things I say? I mean, the Lord's very clear on that. So good works are obeying the word of God, stewarding your gifts. Has God given you a gift? We talked about the sacred calling of motherhood. Be a good mum. Don't be looking all over the world for all the career opportunities. Be a good mum. You're called to that, ladies, mums in the room. We love you, but don't forsake motherhood. We don't want you to be that career woman that gets to the end of her life at 40s and 50s when she can't bear children anymore and she's gone through menopause and says, what have I done? What did I do? This whole idea that we're called to serve our brethren and to steward our gifts and to do good works. If you're unsure, prayer is a good work, isn't it? 
Obedience to Scripture is a good work. Saying no to temptation is a good work. Remaining faithful to your husband or to your wife is a good work. Parents, disciplining your children so that they may know the admonition of the Lord through your loving leadership in the home is a good work. Attending church, contributing to the corporate gathering of the saints, giving to the work of the Lord is a good work. Speaking God's word, injecting biblical truth into every conversation, seasoning your conversations with salt is a good work. Giving a reason for the faith that is in you is a good work. Can you see all I'm doing here is I'm taking the Bible and obedience to it and saying it's a good work. What's not a good work? What's not rewarded in heaven? Anything outside of the scriptural mandate. Well, Wayne, there's things that are going to happen that, uh, that, that aren't in the Bible, so I need to make that up. No, you don't. The Bible is sufficient for everything to do with life and godliness, or are you calling God a liar? So let's not decide that we have our book, the Sacred Scriptures, and then we create another little book over here for what else we do to help God out. That's called Mormonism or a Jehovah's Witness. We need the Watchtower magazine or the Book of Mormon. We are not a cult. We're in the apostolic line where we preach and we have one sacred text and we preach it. And we affirm that constantly so we don't get off the beaten track. We're careful to maintain it. We affirm it constantly. And we make sure that we're doing those things, about to get to part three here, that are good and profitable. This implies that if you're not careful, if you don't maintain, you won't do the good work and you won't profit in the end. I mean, this is a thing that pastors have had challenges with for years because congregations struggle. They profess, but they don't live out their profession. Now, I'm back at Charles Spurgeon here at the Metropolitan Tabernacle, and in this text, he cries out from the pulpit to his congregation, thousands of people, and he says this, Beloved, I fear that preachers often think too well of their congregations. They talk to them as if they were all perfect, or nearly so. I cannot thus flatter you. I have been astounded when I have seen what professing Christians can do. How some dare call themselves followers of Jesus, I cannot tell. It is horrible. We condemn Judas, but his fellow is to be found in many. Our Lord is still sold for gain. He still has at his heels sons of perdition who kiss him and betray him. There are still persons in our churches who need to have the Ten Commandments read to them every Sabbath day. They don't even get the basics is what Spurgeon is saying there. It is not a bad plan of the Church of England to put up the Ten Commandments near the communion table where they can clearly be seen. Some people need to see them. Though I am afraid when they come in their way, they wink hard at some of the commandments, that is, close their eyes to them or ignore them and go away and forget they had seen them, my brethren, such things ought not to be, and yet they are. Point three. These things are good and profitable to men. Let's get to the sweet end of obedience. We can do good. That's what the scripture is assuming. We can do good and we can profit in the end. If we're careful to maintain, it's our gospel duty. We faithfully serve. Well, hang on, I hear some of you thinking, why, why are you preaching works? We're already, according to Paul, justified. We're already saved and going to heaven. My eternal home is secure in Christ. Why do I need to do any more to please God? He's already pleased with me in Christ. I say amen to all of these things. And as a confessing Christian, you are right. If God's Spirit has regenerated you to salvation, you have your home in heaven and an eternal inheritance in Christ. But there is more, saints. You cannot miss this. Your salvation in heaven is assured, but God intends to also reward his faithful servants who have done him well on earth in their life. This is what we will be judged on when we get to glory. If we're already saved in Christ, why a judgment for believers? Because we are judged on how faithful we've been to our calling and doing good works. You won't be judged on your salvation 
Because in Christ you will be found without spot and wrinkle and blemish in him. Amen? It's done in Christ. You're saved. But you will be judged, not on your future salvation, but on your faithful obedience to obeying God's word and doing good works. And saints, God's will not, God will not be mocked. What you sow, you will reap. God knows. This is what we live for, to please him, to obey him, and to honour him. A.W. Pink says this, in the, in the leading up of this quote, to not in the end become a profitable or fruitful servant of the Lord in doing good works for his glory, Pink says, it is to lose sight of the inseparable connection that God has made between our justification and and our sanctification. So what Pink is saying here, and to suppose that one of these may exist without the other is to overthrow the whole gospel. So what he's saying is if we unhinge the car from the trailer, justification from sanctification, we've overthrown the gospel. The gospel is not just you've been saved. The gospel is you go on to good works as a proof that God has graciously saved you. And that proof is a witness that it's God who's at work within you for his name's sake. You're not doing works to make yourself look good. Psalm 23, that I may walk in paths of righteousness for his name's sake, not for you, for him, to bring him glory, to show that you are a new creation. The old man has passed away, the new man has come. Well, for time's sake, Matthew 25, 24 through 28 tells us about the profitable and the unprofitable stewards. So there are two types of people that call Jesus Lord, profitable and unprofitable. Well, Lord, didn't we do all these things in your name? I didn't do anything with my talent. I thought you were a hard man. They had a wrong view of God. I thought you were a hard man. Notice it's man, by the way. They had an earthly view of God. They thought he was like him. He'd cut deals. God doesn't cut deals. He honours obedience to his word. Reaping where you've sown, gathering where you've scattered seed. And I was afraid, fear for the judgment. I guess if you've been unfaithful all your life and not obeyed God's word, you've got every right to be fearful when the master comes looking for the steward's profit. I went and hid your talent in the ground. And look, here is what is yours. Profitable is not giving back to God what he's given you. Remember, the gifts you've been given are without repentance. You've got them for life. It's what you do with them that counts. Are you going to profit in them? How do I profit? I benefit others. I steward and serve others. Who's the greatest in the kingdom? Those that lay themselves down for others. Those that are the greatest servants. You can't serve if somebody's not involved. That's why we have all the one another's in the Bible. Why we're commanded for all of those things to do good works to one another. Well, Jesus calls this servant wicked and lazy. Now, I'm not here preaching condemnation. What I'm preaching is carefulness to maintain good works. Amen. What is the sin of not stewarding what God has given you in good works? It's a sin. It's called wickedness. So we know it's a sin. It's laziness, it's slothfulness. It's addressed in the book of Proverbs. It's addressed in other parts of the Bible. And if you seemingly say that, Lord, Lord, didn't we do all these great ministry endeavors in your name? We had our own ministry. We got 10,000 website hits. We did all these things. And Jesus says, you're not even a Christian. You didn't even do what I asked you to do. As a pastor, I'm not looking to be impressed with everything you've done for the Lord. I'm looking for plain, old, simple, Puritan obedience to the Scripture. Amen? Husbands, do you love your wives as Christ loved the church? What is the will of God? Your sanctification. Stepping away from sin and loving Christ. That tells me you're a Christian. Loving the Lord more than you love your own sin. If it's not clear enough from the Gospels, let's go to our Lord's words in the book of Revelation, Revelation chapter 22. Let's go right to the back end of the Bible. I mean, we can go to the front end of the Bible. We might do this on Wednesday night in our Bible study where Cain and Abel's offering. 
Why was Abel's offering accepted and pleasing to God even when there was no scripture? Why was Abel's offering a good work and Cain's wasn't? I wonder why Cain's wasn't a good offering, a good work, and Abel's was. It may have something to do with what he brought and how he offered it. Revelation 22, behold, I'm coming soon. I'm bringing my recompense, my reward with me to repay everyone for what he has done. There is a repayment to you for what you have done. What have you done? Well, let's go to verse 14. We know what it is that you've done because Jesus says you will be blessed in that day. Blessed are they that do his commandments. Here it is. Plain old, nothing flashy. Read God's word, know what's in it, and obey it. This is why the first three spiritual gifts in the first Corinthians are knowledge of God's word, wisdom of how to apply it, and faith to do it. It doesn't get any more complicated than that. Why do you need faith if you don't need to do anything? You need knowledge of God's word. You need wisdom of how to apply it. Amen? Some of you aren't sure about that. And then faith to do it. Which is why the Lord's disciples pray, give us faith, Lord. 1 Corinthians 3, we've got this picture here of what this judgment looks like. The beam of seat judgment of Christ for every believer. They're all saved. I want you to notice in 1 Corinthians 3 they all go through saved. Some are saved by fire. Some are saved with reward. But they're all saved. 1 Corinthians 3 10 through 15. According to the grace of God which is given to me as a wise master builder there's wisdom I've laid the foundation and another builds thereon. Let every man be careful. Take heed how he builds. For no other foundation can be laid that which is Christ Jesus. Now if any man builds on this foundation, gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay and stubble, every man's work will be made manifest or revealed for the day shall declare it. That is the judgment day. Because it shall be revealed by fire and the fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is. If any man's work abide, he has what has built thereon, and he shall receive a reward. So the judgment is based on rewards, not on saving faith. And if any man's work shall be burned, that is his good works, shall be burned, he shall suffer loss, but he himself shall be saved, yet so as by fire. 1 Corinthians 4 verse 5, we are to judge nothing, that is in regards to eternal reward until the Lord comes and he will bring to light those hidden things of darkness and will make manifest the counsels of the heart and then every man shall have their praise of God. So Wayne, we're not to judge anything. No, we're to judge. We're given the Bible. It gives us clear wisdom on what's right and what's wrong. We make clear discerning judgments on what's evil and what's good from Scripture. Paul says to the church of Corinthians later on, you who are spiritual must judge. You must get this right. You're going to be judging angels. You've got to know how to make right, godly, biblical judgments in the church. What don't we judge on? The eternal judgments, the eternal rewards, and who's saved and who isn't. Lead them. Their tares, their wheat, God makes that decision. Ultimately, though, your life will tell us everything we need to see. So the good works are proof that you're headed for a good reward. If there is a confession with no fruit, what do we get? John the Baptist. The axe is already laid at the tree. You're already being chopped down. Produce fruit worthy of your repentance. The gospel has never changed from John the Baptist to Jesus' words in Revelation 22. Well, Spurgeon would say, As someone did in his congregation, this is all legal talk, all these works. The preacher is preaching up works instead of grace. What? Will you dare say that, Spurgeon says? I will meet you face to face at God's right hand at the last day if you dare to insinuate such a gross thing. Dare you say that I do not preach continually salvation by the grace of God and by the grace of God only? And now having preached salvation by grace without a moment's hesitation, I shall also continually affirm 
that they which have believed in God must be careful to maintain good works. Lastly, A.W. Pink, many persons in their eagerness to support an orthodoxy, uh, orthodoxy system speak of salvation by grace and faith in such a manner as to undervalue the holiness and life devoted to God. So high doctrine, low living. He goes on, but there is no ground for this in the Holy Scriptures. The same gospel that declares salvation to be freely by the grace of God through faith in the blood of Christ and asserts in the strongest terms that sinners are justified by the righteousness of the Saviour imputed to them on their believing in him without any respect to the works of the law also assures us that without holiness no man shall see God. That believers are cleansed by the blood of the atonement, that their hearts are purified by faith, which by works of love they overcome the world, and that the grace that brings salvation to all men teaches these believers that they deny ungodliness and worldly lust, that they should live soberly and righteously and godly in the present world. They're all good works. Pink finishes this very long quote, my apologies, by saying, Any fear that the doctrine of grace will suffer from the most strenuous inculcation of good works on the scriptural foundation betrays an inadequate and greatly defective acquaintance with divine truth. What he's saying is, if you think that grace voids good works, you don't know what's in the Bible. And any tampering with the scriptures in order to silence their testimony in favour of the fruits of righteousness as absolutely necessary in the Christian is a perversion and a forgery with respect to the word of God. Saints, we're out on time today, but let us take heed of the word today to be careful to maintain good works in his name for his glory. Daniel March uh, just finishes with a beautiful hymn that I'd like to read to you, and then I'll pray. Hark the voice of Jesus crying, who will go and work today? Fields are white and harvest waiting, who will bear the sheaves away? Loud and long the master calls, rich rewards he offers free. Who will answer gladly saying, here I am, send me, send me. If you cannot cross the ocean and the heathen lands explore, you can find the heathen nearer, you can help them at your door. If you cannot give your thousands, you can give the widow's might, and the least you give for Jesus will be precious in his sight. If you cannot speak like angels, if you cannot preach like Paul, you can tell the love of Jesus. You can say, he died for all. If you cannot rouse the wicked with the judgment, dread, and alarms, you can lead the little children to the Savior's waiting arms. Lead, let none hear you idly saying, there is nothing I can do while the souls of men are dying and the master calls for you. Take the task he gives you gladly. Let your work, your pleasure be. Answer quickly when he calls. Here I am. Send me. Send me. Let us pray. Great God of our eternal salvation, may we know the calling to serve you by doing good works for your glory, to obey, to serve, to love one another all according to your word. Help us to build upon the foundation that is Jesus Christ, to be good and profitable servants, doing those things that are pleasing in your sight, O oh Lord. We ask it all in the name of your Son, Jesus. Amen. Amen. Please stand for the reading of the benediction. And now let us be confident of this very thing, that he who begun a good work in you will continue to perform it until the day of Jesus Christ's return. Amen. Blessings, everyone. Please be seated. Thank you so much for your time, attention this morning. I trust the word of the Lord.